Today's video is sponsored by Six Foot Tall Tumbleweed. Listen to the new album Wheel of Suffering on iTunes or on Spotify today. Dark skin, bright eyes, big booty, and thick ass thighs. Hello Phillies and fellers, Brad the Guitologist here. In this video we're going to take a look at this 1977 Marshall JMP Mark II lead head. This is the 50 watt version. If that sounds like something you'd be interested in, stick around. The JMP series is the forerunner to the JCM 800 series which came out in the early 80s. It's basically the same amplifiers but just uh, renamed uh, versions of the same amplifiers. Uh, this is the model 2204, which is the again the 50 watt version, which also corresponds to the 2204 JCM 800. In addition to the two inputs labeled high and low sensitivity, we also have a preamp volume, a master volume, treble, middle, bass, uh, presence, and we have a standby and power switch. This particular example has its share of dings and road dents and so forth. There's one there, uh, here's one here. Uh, there's several here along the bottom edge. This the bottom edge is usually where you find a lot of the dents. Uh, here's a gash over here on the side. Uh, I've got some little dents and gashes up here on the top, but the top escaped a lot more than the bottom. Got a larger size gash over here, a couple of others. And there's another little gash up here on the top. A lot of these actually can be uh, minimized in appearance uh, or fixed all together and there might even be a couple of these we may be able to uh, make completely disappear which might be a, a fun thing to do while we have this. I had to uh, order the caps for this thing. It uh, requires three can caps which we will see in just a minute so I've got, gone ahead and put those on order in anticipation of replacing those because they're original still. Before we go any further with that, let's take a look at the back here. Uh, you can see this one still has the back door. I've already loosened the screws so we can get it out here in just a second, but let's take a look at the, what's on the back. And you can see this is a master model 50 watt Mark II lead, made in England. We have a pair of speaker jacks, uh, an output impedance selector. Uh, and the thing about these is this is a jumper selector. It's not a dial, so you can't turn this. Uh, the, these will, this will actually come out. And it has a set of jumpers on the bottom. And a little window. And you can see we have 16, 4 ohm, and 8 ohm selections. Uh, we will leave it on 16 for the moment. We will probably test this on an 8 ohm cabinet eventually. Uh, you can see here this uh, main selector is missing. Uh, on some of these, there's actually a selector here also where you can change this for use in England down to uh, uh, 120 for use in the U.S. or North America. And this is just uh, this is just a North American version without the selector. We have a high tension fuse and a main fuse. Removing the back door. We can see the tubes and the uh, and the old power capacitors that we are going to replace. These are labeled uh, daily, and there are actually two capacitors in each one of these cans. There's uh, 50 microfarads at 500 volts, two of those in each one, and there's one over here on this side as well. See, we have a large power transformer, uh, output transformer, and a choke. 312AX7 preamp tubes and in this case we have uh, 6550 power tubes which is what uh, this particular example shipped with. These are relatively new power tubes it looks like uh, so I don't suspect these necessarily a, of being a problem but we will uh, we'll check that. Looks like we have JJ tubes for the preamp uh, at least one of them. That's a, that's a Sovtech in V2. And we have a JJ in V3. Customer also said this amp is from 1977, which just happens to be my birth year. So this should be an interesting one. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and pull the chassis. Uh, we'll get a, bit, a little better look inside. And then we'll probably turn our attention at some point to the cabinet and see if we can't fix a couple of those scuffs on the cabinet. 
All right, we're gonna take the chassis out. In order to remove the chassis, the screws are on the bottom on these Marshall heads. Looks like to me that uh, someone has replaced the feet on this one because they're in really, they're in really too good of a shape. And plus, those screws right there are not dirty at all. They really don't uh, ring true for, for the rest of the cabinet. And we'll stand it back up. And these rubber feet on these make them really, really hard to kind of scooch around. The older ones were more plasticky, and they kind of moved around a lot freer. Uh, but these replacements have really rubbery feel to them, so they they stick to whatever you put them on. I mean, this surface, this desk, I can't really push this thing around very easily. I have to actually lift it up slightly to get to reduce the friction to move it around, which is a good thing. You don't want it rattling itself off of your uh, your your eight twelve full stack <laughs> onto the floor. Okay, just looking at the cabinet here, you can see that there's a shielding. Uh, this is like a piece of, I guess this is aluminum sheeting. Uh, also of note, the uh, cabinets on these um, look to be finger jointed. I believe they are. Okay, here's the chassis out of the cabinet. And we can get a little better look at some of the codes on the transformers. I'm not, a, I'm not really a European or British uh, code expert. Most of the stuff I do is... Um, American stuff, so these codes are fairly meaningless to me. I'm sure that's a model number. Probably the same with this one, I would imagine. That's 78. That might be 1978. I don't know. No, probably not, because he did say this was 77, or supposed to be. But customers aren't always right on that sort of thing either. Let's see. I don't see any other codes on these, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I do. There's something, something right there, a stamp. 477, so that might be the fourth week of 1977. That might be what that means. Uh, because this one has the same thing, 477. That might be fourth week of 1977 also. Uh, this little transformer, I don't see... Well, I do see a code down there, but it's going to be kind of hard to read. If not impossible to read. But I always like to, I always like to check out the codes and everything on these amplifiers that we do uh, while we have them out somebody somewhere sometime is probably going to want to want to have a record of this sort of thing so why not provide it while we have uh, all of these nice cool vintage amplifiers out on the bench there's a little sticker of some kind D-E-L-T-D and then a little code um, as always on Marshalls we have the inspection tag over here And this one is, again, designated for the United States. Not sure what that B948 code means. But you can see where everybody has uh, signed off on this. And that looks like that does say 77 right there. It's always backwards uh, in Great Britain, so it's uh, uh, the 29th day of the fourth month of 1977. I can just make that out. So that'll be the fourth month probably on those Transformers, not the fourth week. Looks pretty good inside. It's uh, been worked on before. I can tell that because those two capacitors right there are newer capacitors. And you can see, uh, you can see possibly that one beside it right there also. That looks like it's been changed. Yeah, I'm certain that's been changed because you can see the blob of solder right there. They've soldered it uh, from the top of the board rather than trying to, you know, pull the board out and do it that way. They've soldered it from top. Uh, that resistor right there is a replacement. Uh, that capacitor right there is a replacement. We have a couple of missing 68K resistors. Uh, we have a missing 330 microfarad uh, bypass capacitor, looks like on the first stage. So yeah, somebody's been in here and modded this thing before. So it's not, you know, it's not virgin, but it's not in bad shape either. Uh, these uh, mustard capacitors, 
are usually all the rage. You know, you'll read in the forums and everything about how good these capacitors are supposed to be. And in all honesty, if you were to uh, replace the, all those mustard capacitors and put it before some discerning uh, ears, they probably wouldn't be able to tell a lick of difference. <laughs> and that's the God's honest truth. Unless you were to just use like uh, ceramic capacitors or something in there that were microphonic. I mean, then, then they would be able to tell, but... Uh, there's our bias adjust pot. Looks like we have one replacement pot. And again, that's probably a modification. We will check that and see if it's the same same value as original. But these uh, these pots are original for sure. You can see where the uh, chassis on these um, had had some options. Uh, there's another couple of holes over here that they could have uh, punched through the face plate and used uh, for some other different models. There's also a a big square over here for another switch uh, for a different model so kind of a more all-purpose chassis once again these uh, these big power resistors here are going to be replaced the other ones actually under the board so we're gonna have to lift the board to get to the other one also you can see uh, you can see the name Carol written right there I don't know if that's the original inspector but I suspect that's the case. Well, one thing I guess we can do is go ahead and uh, we'll plug it into a plug it into a speaker here on the desk and just uh, see what what it's kind of doing or not doing uh, at low volumes. So we'll switch this to eight ohms for the moment because that's what this speaker is. And yeah, let's fire it up slowly on the variac here and see what it's what it's kind of doing. And it is not on. I think I switched it off. Try that again. Or no, it's dead. It's completely dead. Why would that be? We probably have a blown fuse. <laughs> and that could be because we have a shorter capacitor, potentially. So I guess there is some troubleshooting we can do here at the outset. Okay, this is the high tension fuse. This is the one that blows a lot. Fucking thing's not plugged in. <laughs> 64 volts in, which is our customary stopping point since that's when my meter starts to read over here. 0.22 amps of current draw, 14 and a half watts. So yeah, I don't see any pro issue with that. Uh, a few more volts and we should start to hear something. All right, we're at 84 volts. We should be getting something on the speaker. Yes, we do. We do have something on the speaker. Now, if I recall correctly, this, this thing is basically just in here for... Uh, you know, a spa treatment, essentially. that It's, it's just in here for a, a routine service. So there's not a whole lot we're, we're, we're likely to have to do to it, uh, but we are definitely going to ch go ahead and change those uh, three big power capacitor cans. You know, they're old. They're from 1977. They are now 40 years old. They're as old as I am. So uh, about time for them to be replaced. They do have a sell-by date, all as all power capacitors do, so we're, we're going to replace those as a matter of course. And then we'll also go ahead and clean sockets, uh, clean input jacks, clean pots, all the cleaning stuff. Uh, and then we'll test everything out, check uh, bias on the output tubes, make sure that's okay. It is somewhat interesting to me that, um, that the second input is without its 330 microfarad bypass capacitor that's that's kind of interesting it's almost like they've tweaked uh, that channel to be less of a fender like channel and more of a I don't know because they've they've rebiased it as well so I'm, I'm guessing they've actually tried to rock that channel up more uh, even than the other channel so I don't know I guess we'll see we'll see what they've done but okay so let's kill this thing for now and uh, We'll get back to it. Like I said, we're going to check out a couple of those dings on the cabinet while we're waiting for capacitors to arrive. 
Another thing I want to see is how long it takes these capacitors to drain when I turn uh, turn that down and not long at all the main capacitor is draining down to 7 volts under 7 volts in a matter of no time flat that one's nothing so yeah uh, these actually have uh, bleeder resistors um, somewhere in here. I forget where exactly they are. I think it might be... Is it, uh, is it one of these over here? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Anyway, there's some bleeder resistors somewhere in this thing. Uh, that will bleed off um, you know, everything to ground when you shut it down. We've talked about bleeder resistors a couple times on this channel and about uh, whether or not uh, whether or not they're really necessary um, because usually when you when you turn off an amplifier the tubes will continue to conduct for a period of time after you've switched the amplifier off and that that conduction uh, as the tubes cool um, usually will drain the capacitors off of any remaining voltage that's left in them. Uh, it'll suck that voltage out of them. Um, I mean, and they always kind of will come back up a little bit, so there will be a little bit stored in there, but it's not going to be usually enough to kill you. This is one of the things that not many people will talk about or tell you about because of liability issues. They don't want to be sued by anyone, um, and I don't want to be sued by anyone either. But I'm not showing you how to do this stuff. I'm just letting you look over my shoulder while I do it because it's for entertainment, and I'm not trying to teach you. This is the other reason I don't do um, I don't do Skype, you know, to help you troubleshoot your stuff or any of that. I'll try to give you some advice if I can, you know, on what you might try or what you might do, but it's all at your own risk, and that that's understood on this channel. So, you know, that that usually goes without saying. I, I'm not I'm not trying to teach anybody how to repair your stuff. That's just that's not the goal of this channel. It's just entertainment. Um, at any rate, what I was gonna say is the. Uh, you know the dangers of being electrocuted and you know killed by uh, voltages that have been left in amplifiers stored in power capacitors is usually grossly overstated for most amplifiers there are some amplifiers that do store voltages uh, for whatever reason the designs of them uh, is such that you know the after you turn off the the unit, you know, the capacitors just just maintain a charge, and they haven't really been designed to drain it um, properly, or you know, the tubes cool too rapidly and it doesn't drain it all off. And there's enough voltage there that it would give you a, a heck of a shock, a heck of a fright. And if you happen to be touching it with both hands, and you know, standing in a puddle of water or something, or you know, if it goes right through your heart or something, you have a palpitation already or you already have a heart condition, you know, maybe it will kill you. It's possible. But I've been hitting, I've been hit by full 500 volts of, uh, <laughs> you know, of DC across, well, granted, it was across my finger and it went kind of in my finger and out of my finger or in my hand and out of my hand or down my elbow, you know, uh, and, and out to something maybe I was sitting on something or whatever and it's kind of done that um, and you know I'm still here to tell the tale and I've been hit by 120 volt AC before uh, several times too and I'm still here to tell the tale so it, it's not like every time you encounter electricity it's gonna kill you it does hurt <laughs> sometimes it hurts like a son of a bitch sometimes it feels like you know you've been bitten by a small animal or something you know um, and leaves burns and things like that. One time I had a, a burn. I, don't, I forget where it was now, um, but uh, I, it was on it was on my finger for several of my videos because I got burned and it was like it was just my finger was all screwed up for a while. But yeah, you know, point being, this is this is um, this can be dangerous, uh, but it can also be fun. You know, it's, it's definitely entertaining. I'm sure for some of you because enough of you watch this silly crap. <laughs> okay, we're going to turn our attention to a couple of these uh, a couple of these dings on this cabinet just for the heck of it since we've got this thing. Uh, but a couple of these could really benefit from a little bit of attention and would probably disappear almost entirely. 
and if you ever get a ding on one of your uh, old amps, um, always try to try to keep the the little bits of um, Tolex that f that flake off or peel back. Don't don't just rip them off and call it a day because if you leave them on there, you can always glue them back down. Let's try this perspective right here. I'm just going to use some regular super glue, and we're going to uh, glue this back down. I get a little bit under this lip right here for sure because it needs to lie flat. And that stuff will tr keep trying to peel back up, but you just got to be persistent with it. Eventually, it will get uh, it will start to get tacky here, and will begin to stay down. But you just got to be persistent with it. Okay, and then once you've got it down, you can come back. What I usually do is come back with a Sharpie and just go over the little boundaries where it was and also over just the area in general. And just blend that in kind of. And this is just a wet wipe that I'm using for this. And once you're done, you can barely tell it was ever there. Okay, now the same thing with this one. We're gonna just basically coat the area in the super glue. And this one should go back down fairly nicely as well. The problem with this one is uh, I don't think it will cover all of it. But we should get a good portion of it covered. And plus there's a little bit of uh, wood that's missing here. So when this one got nicked, it actually took a tiny chunk of the wood with it. So there's going to be an indentation no matter what we do. That one went back down okay. Um, again, it's not it's not perfect, and it won't be because uh, some of the wood was taken when it was damaged. But it definitely it's going to look better than it did. So I mean, you know, just when you look at it from a distance, uh, that'll look a little bit better. It's not, you know. You can still tell it's there, but a couple more little places down here on this corner. I may go ahead and address this one especially just because it's still got a little bit of the Tolex here that we can lay back down. I 
All right, there's that one looking a little bit better. It's not going to disappear entirely. Now these, I think I'm just going to leave. I'm going to leave those how they are. You know, it's, it doesn't hurt us to have some, have a few little areas, you know, where it looks looks worn. But you know, any area where you can lay back down some of the Tolex where it's kind of sticking out, so that way it doesn't get ripped any further. It helps to go ahead and glue that stuff back down. Okay, so it's been a few days and we're back with this Marshall handful of capacitors here. We're going to replace the ones that are in here. We have two over here we're going to drop out and we've got one more that's under the board. I've already liberated the board of its nuts. So we can see this one down here. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and loosen these and drop this down and I'm going to try to solder it uh, out the other side. I think that uh, that's probably the way to to do these.
Okay, so here are our new capacitors um, all in here. Here are the old ones. And like I said, these were these were still operating okay. Uh, the thing is, they're just, you know, they're 40 years old. Um, and if you want to keep this amp running tip-top and not have any problems, it's really best to go ahead and change those. Um, these are definitely smaller profile than the old ones. But they should operate uh, just about the same. So, uh, yeah, I need to uh, tighten down the board again and then we will move along to check and bias on the output tubes making sure those are okay i'll go ahead and clean sockets as well uh, while we're here and just basically do general routine maintenance sort of stuff the sockets cleaned um, let's go ahead and flip this thing and put the board uh, back down okay so there's the board back in and down uh, I think next thing we want to do is plug it into the load and we'll check the bias and adjust as necessary Okay, so the service is nearly done on this thing uh, all I really have left to do is to clean the pots and uh, bias the output tubes um, and we're going to go ahead and bias the output tubes now there's um, several different ways you can do this there's several different methods that you can use uh, I did go ahead and uh, install a couple of uh, one ohm resistors from the cathode to ground on each of the output tubes you can see it right there uh, it's a, a metal oxide um, one watt one ohm resistor on each of those um, and that's going to give you a, a point through which you can measure the uh, the bias current so what we're going to do uh, is measure that bias current uh, but we're also going to do uh, something a little bit different we're going to take some other measurements and we're going to look at some tables that are readily available online that you can also uh, check out if uh, if you're kind of new to biasing and you want you know some uh, some kind of general you know sort of guidelines that you can go by now I've, sh I've shown over the course of many many videos different ways to uh, bias you know different types of amplifiers and uh, you can dig back through some of my older videos to see you know different methods of biasing but uh, this is going to be the method uh, that we use here we're going to check out some online tables and uh, see how kind of close they are to the realities of the situation as they exist in an actual amp. So uh, let's go ahead and flip this thing on. I think we've got everything clear here. Yep. And while we're waiting for this to warm up, I want to also uh, just check out the tail of the tape over here. And you can see right now we're drawing about 40 watts of power. That should in increase here as the tubes warm up. And you can see the current also going up. It should probably go up to around 0.7 amps, somewhere around there. 700 milliamps or so. Maybe not quite that much. So yeah, that's, so that's what it's drawing on the primary side of the power transformer. Um, so let's go ahead and measure our plate voltages. And we'll zoom you out here so you can actually see the meter. <clears throat> and the sniffles all of a sudden. I'm Rick James, bitch. <laughs> Draw yourself. <laughs> All right, we got right at 400 volts on the plate. Uh, that one's right at 400 volts also. Uh, so what we're going to do here is look at some uh, tables, again, that are readily available online for this, uh, in this case, the 6550, but 
there are tables that exist for, you know, lots of different uh, tube types. Okay, this particular table can be found on uh, tedweber.com. And I'll put a link down in the description if you want to check this website out. But you can see all the different tube types here in the tables. Oh, yeah. uh, here's an EL84 and a 6V6. And you can see that the maximum plate dissipation for one of these tubes is 12 watts. 70% uh, for each of the different voltages. Um, you can see here a 60%, which they're labeling an average. They're labeling the 70% as hot and about 50% as being cool. And it gives you uh, the milliamp readings that you should be reading uh, for each one of these voltages. So we're going to see how this works. Uh, usually I just go and calculate the thing, but um, there's a 7189, which of course is an industrial EL84. Uh, EL34 is right there at 25 watts. We have the 6L6s, of course, at 30 watts of plate dissipation. And on up to scale, we have the 6550s on the higher end, which is what we have in this amplifier, which have a plate dissipation of 35 whopping watts. Uh, so we can see here for 400 volts, if we want this thing biased hot, we should see uh, about 61 milliamps of current. Uh, on average, it's going to be kind of hard for you to see the average reading, but it is 53 milliamps for 60% and 44 milliamps on the cool side at 50%. So what we're going to do, we're just going to check out this table, see how it kind of works out in the real world here. Um, and then we'll also do the calculation and see how close it is. So to measure the current uh, through one of these one ohm resistors, uh, basically the reason that we choose a one ohm resistor is because it converts directly. If we think about Ohm's law, which is amps equals volts divided by ohms, if you're dividing something by one, it is just you know whatever it is you're dividing by one. So since this resistance in ohms is just one, then whatever we're measuring uh, will will end up being exactly the same measurement uh, but in milliamps so we can it's just a direct conversion so it takes all the guesswork out of it and this one ohm resistance is not really uh, biasing the tubes in any way as far as a cathode bias it's such a low value so it doesn't really affect anything so what we're going to do is uh, measure from from here to here in terms of voltage drop on that particular tube, on the left-hand tube, we're getting about 38.7 milliamps of current. Uh, let's check out the other one. That's actually on the low side. We should, uh, 44 milliamps would be cool. So um, we could check out the other one as well, but it should be very close to the same thing. So we're, we can figure about 39 milliamps on that tube. And if they're well matched, they should be uh, very close. And yes, indeed, this one's about 39.9 or 40 milliamps thereabout. So yeah, pretty close. Uh, so what we want to do is get this uh, 39 milliamps. We need to get this value up to you know something closer to uh, you know between 55 and 60 milliamps, something along those lines. So what we want to do is turn our bias pot, and here's the thing about doing these sorts of measurements. As you turn this pot and you raise this uh, milliamp rating, you're also going to have to go back and check your uh, plate voltage again because that's going to change. So first things first, let's go ahead and let's adjust the pot. This pot doesn't have a whole lot of range. 50, 56 milliamps is about as high as we can go. Um, so it's interesting that they shipped this amplifier with 6550s, and this is as high as the um, this is as high as the bias can go. I think if we really wanted to dial this thing in hot, we would probably want to replace 
this resistor that resistor right there is in line with this potentiometer and we could change this resistance um, so that we could you know get uh, we could get closer to a you know more of a hot uh, sort of bias situation we're probably not well we may not have to do that we'll see what we we'll see what we're going to do here okay so let's measure the plate voltage now all right we're at 391 volts okay so if we go back to our table here's the problem with the table and using something like this there is no 391 volts it's pretty limited on its selection you've got 400 volts 425 and it kind of goes up from there so it doesn't go down really as low as 391 volts uh, they really expect you to have more voltage on the plates of a 6550 so it doesn't really give you that option so we're gonna have to turn to our calculator to do this point zero five 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 times 391 which is our voltage and that gives us 21.5 watts of dissipation. Now, we know the dissipation of a 6550 tube, the maximum is 35. And if we multiply that figure by 0.7, which is going to be 70% of that figure, we get 24.5. So that would be our 70%. Uh, let's do a 60% calculation. So 35 uh, times 0.6 so this will be a 60 percent will give us about 21 watts of plate dissipation for 60 percent so that would be an average at least according to this chart so uh, where we are in our current bias setting we are slightly above the average rating of 60 percent we're at 21.5 watts of plate dissipation uh, on one of these tubes and probably slightly more uh, on the other one so this is probably pretty good now a 6550 once again this is a very robust tube it can handle a lot of plate dissipation the size of a 6550 in, uh, in comparison to like an EL34 and a 6L6 is large these have very large plates a large surface area and they can dissipate a lot of wattage so you know 35 being the maximum I think we're pretty good where we sit right now that means if we were to jam on this thing pretty much full bore uh, for an entire concert we should never really reach the point where these tubes are operating at uh, at or exceeding the maximum plate dissipation let's go ahead and clean those pots up front and I think we'll be pretty much ready to seal this thing up Okay, so this thing has been modified, not extensively, but it's definitely been modified uh, quite a lot. Uh, some of the modifications that have been done, uh, you can see down here a couple of uh, grid stopping resistors going into these first stages. Uh, one of them is coming from one of the inputs, the other is coming from the other input. And it looks like someone moved these uh, down here to the socket probably an attempt to uh, kind of clean things up a little bit they normally would have been up here on the board you can see where they've been removed we also have this 330 microfarad capacitor that's missing this was a bypass capacitor for this channel and this would have made this uh, channel really fender-esque really bassy you know a lot of people like this channel for uh, for its kind of real fat round tone and without this capacitor in here it's going to be a you know different sounding channel so that's an 820 ohm resistor so that is the original value just not the original resistor this resistor obviously has been changed let's see that is uh was originally a hundred K that's probably a plate resistor and it's also a hundred K it just looks like it's been changed so somebody probably burned this resistor up or it had a problem at some point this capacitor has been changed so that's a place so that's going through to the next stage that's a coupling capacitor a couple capacitors here that have been changed those are uh let's see what is that it's kind of hard to tell we have a little capacitor here that's also been changed you can see where that's been tacked in on on top of the board 
Uh, we have a we have a pot. We have a pot also over here that has been changed. I'm not sure if the value has been changed. I need to measure that. That's the base pot. So we'll measure that in a bit and see if that value has been changed. I might as well go ahead and do that. Okay, so this will be a 500k pot. Normally that would have been a 1 meg pot. I think we'll probably end up just listening to it first and see what it sounds like. Um, but again, that is going to remove a lot of the uh, bass out of this amp. And also, I'm kind of curious if the uh, whether the capacitors in the tone stack, uh, the values of those capacitors have been changed. I think I think that's these capacitors over here. Okay. Well, okay. So there's the wire. So, okay. So it's going to that one. Yeah. So these these three capacitors right here are the uh, tone capacitors. It's just interesting that those are the ones that have been changed because they're the same values. That's the original value, that's an original value, and let me see what this is. What does that say? Does that say 470? Yeah. Okay, so that is also, that's also an original value. So those three capacitors right there, this, this, and this, those are the tone capacitors. Yeah, so it looks like the tone stack looks like it's original with the exception of the base pot which has been uh, reduced to 500k from one meg. So I don't know, uh, it's interesting that those are changed. Probably what happened is, at some stage in this amp's existence, um, someone probably came in here and meddled with these values and did some modifications or something. And then another tech came along later and put these values back to stock, but they didn't have the original you know, mustard caps that would have been in these positions. So that's my theory anyway. It makes sense to me at the moment. Okay, so I have tried this amp, uh, plugged it in, jammed on it for a little bit, and what I've found is, and also spoke to the customer and asked them just to try to figure out what his initial uh, problem was again. He just said it was, he just said it was kind of, um, kind of harsh, non-musical was kind of, sort of his description. Um, now, of course, we knew we had to replace caps anyway, and uh, thought that that may take care of some of it. But I, when I test played this, I noticed that uh, the treble pot doesn't hardly do anything at all. It just, uh, you can turn it, and actually it does do something, but when you turn it, the treble up, um, it seems to drop out gain. So, I don't know, I don't think it's hooked up correctly. So I'm going to get in here and, and check that again and make sure this treble pot is hooked up correctly. This may be a new pot and I just didn't notice. I know the base pot has changed and we may put the base pot back to stock. I don't know, it doesn't really sound like uh, you would expect one of these um, 2204s to sound. So let's get back inside of it and see what more we can do with this. We may put some things back to stock. Okay, I've got this thing back open and uh, right off the bat I think I see the problem. Uh, right here are three capacitors in the tone stack. And the yellow one in the foreground is the one that hooks up to the treble pot. That one has a 47K written on it. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and remove the capacitor from the top here. Um, but uh, I'm going to put the new one in through the board, but I'm just getting this one out of the way. Well, out of the circuit, this thing is uh, measuring 0.1 nanofarads, um, and the appropriate value, again, should be 0.5, so I don't know. I guess maybe this is 4.7, and then you have a zero, you have an implied zero after that, I guess. I don't know. Before I pin this board back down or anything like that, I want to go ahead and make sure um, that was the only problem. Works now. It didn't work before at all. Uh, what you would do is if you turned it up past about halfway and got to 10, it would, uh, it would actually start to cut out some of the gain. So it was...
Now this base pot once again has been changed to a 500k. I'm going to change that back to a 1 meg like it's supposed to be originally. Uh, because that makes a lot more sense. You're going to get more base on this thing. Also, um, there's a missing <laughs> bypass capacitor once again on that first uh, on the low sensitivity channel. Um, that bypass capacitor right there was a 330 microfarad. I'm going to put something in here while I have this board up anyway and I can easily access the bottom. I'm going to go ahead and take the pins that have been cut out of there and we're going to go ahead and put a uh, capacitor in there for bypass. Okay, so let's go ahead and yank this pot for a 1 meg. Okay, now on this uh, low sensitivity channel, I do not stock 330 microfarad. Uh, 330 is pretty much overkill. That's like uh, that's like base amp sort of territory, so uh, 50 is probably a better decision. I think we're pretty much ready to go with this. I'm going to go ahead and cinch this board back down and we'll give it another test. Okay, let's check it now. And testing it the first time, so. So that treble definitely works now. Definitely more bass. That's Thank you. 